All right, everyone, let's make a start, eh? All right, so as we discussed yesterday, we're very lucky today to have Graham Campbell from Glencore. Um, Sorry? Very lucky. Very lucky, yeah. <laughs> um, and he's going to be talking about chemical engineering, some of the chemical engineering he's done in industry, and a little bit of perspective from the industry side about what a chemical engineer does and those sorts of jobs. So um, I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, so chemical engineering. The definition that I stole straight from Wikipedia, so I'm sorry about that, is that it's the engineering of chemicals, energies, and the processes that create or convert them. Um, chemical engineering is not necessarily the most helpful title for a chemical engineer because when you go and get a job as a chemical engineer, typically the job that you'll be doing is called a process engineer. Uh, most of the jobs out there is where you're actually responsible for the successful operation for an entire process. And that involves the quantity of goods that you're producing, it involves the quality of goods that you're producing, and it also involves the efficiency that's involved with producing all those goods and making sure that your company stays profitable. Um, so for instance, some of those processes might be the extraction of gas from the ground, so we can send that off to customers who need gas. It might be the extraction and conversion of oil to petroleum products and things. It might be the extraction of dirt and turning that into some sort of metal, iron or nickel or or in my case, copper. Um, so for instance, the production process that I'm in charge of is uh, at the copper refinery just uh, down the road here in Townsville. And what we do is we turn uh, copper anodes, which is the one on the left there, uh, which are 99.7% copper, we turn them into 99.9999% copper. And the reason we need to do that is because if you've got copper and you want to use it in an electronic circuit, or if you want to use it for copper piping, or if you want to add some zinc to it and make brass doorknobs, if that's your thing, you need very, very pure copper, 99.999% uh, copper. And all of that action happens within uh, that thing in the middle, which is the electrochemical cells. But it's not just the electrical chemical cells that you as a process engineer will look after. It's the whole process. It's everything from the anodes that we receive from the smelter, which is out at Mount Isa, making sure that they're of the right quality, that when they go in, they're machined effectively so that they're going to do the right job. And at the end, when we've got a bit of scrap left over, we process that and make new anodes. Uh, we also look after the cathode side of things, making sure that the mother plates that we use are, are working correctly. Uh, there's a whole electrolyte circulation that goes through all of the cells in order to make sure that um, uh, your reagents are being delivered at the right concentrations across the whole uh, face of the cathode, for instance. We have electrolyte purification plants and we also have a byproduct called slimes which contains a lot of gold and silver and things. So we need to make sure we filter that and export that um, to customers as well. So as a chemical engineer, Try not to think chemical, think process, because really that's, that's what the job is. It's a process engineer. So I'll just tell you about how my process works in more detail. Basically what we do is we start with the anode, which is the 99.7% copper, and a, uh, what we call a mother plate, which is a sheet of stainless steel. And we put those in a bath of electrolyte. The electrolyte contains about 180 grams per litre of uh, sulfuric acid, and about 50 grams per litre of copper, which is um, basically copper sulphate. And what we do is we um, basically just push electricity through it, for want of a better term. And what happens is, is at the anode, uh, a oxidation reaction occurs. So the copper that's in its solid form goes into its ionic form, which is copper 2 plus, and releases a couple of electrons. They then travel around the circuit. And then at the other end, at the cathode, the copper which is in solution in its ionic form, in uh, Cu2+, plus, uh, absorbs two electrons, uh, gets reduced and becomes copper in its metallic form and plates onto that mother plate. And after we uh, leave that basically running for about eight to 10 days at 26,000 amps, we end up with uh, a sheet of copper on each side of that mother plate and we take that whole thing out, we give the mother plate a bit of a flex and those, that copper that's plated on there pops off we stack them up into piles and we ship those overseas. And that's our pure copper um, that we've created. Now, our, our cell isn't just one anode and one cathode. Um, we actually have 45 anodes and 44 anodes, one, an one sorry, 44 cathodes with one cathode in between uh, every 
set of anodes, and that's just uh, just to get the maximum efficiency out of using that cell. Now, the reason it's able to uh, plate out so purely on the cathode side is basically down to the electrochemical series. So, for any of you who did chemistry last year or in high school, you might remember the electrochemical series. So, what what this is? It's basically a table which describes uh, the metal's desire to be either in their metal form as a solid or in their ionic form. And so the ones at the top are more likely to want to be ions and the ones down the bottom are more likely to want to be in their solid form. So if you get two metals and you put them next to each other, the one that's higher up on the table will end up dissolving into solution and the other one will end up plating out of solution. So what happens in our process is at the anode we're trying to get the oxidation reaction to occur. So if we've got any of that stuff in the pink that's above the copper, which is in a fairly low concentration in the, in the anode, they're more readily wanting to give up their electrons so that they can go into solution. So that ends up happening and then we end up also uh, putting a lot of copper in the solution. But because we've got so much copper in the bulk, we end up with a potential at that electrode of 0.34 volts. Now that means that the stuff that's in the green section um, doesn't end up going into the solution because it needs just that little bit of extra energy, a little bit of extra impetus in order to get it into the solution. So it sees the 0.34 volts and it decides, I'm not giving up my electrons for that, that's not worth it. And so they just sit there and do nothing. And as the anode dissolves around them, all the rest of the copper and the impurities dissolves around them, they just fall to the bottom of the cell as a solid. Um, and so as they fall to the bottom of the cell, they form what we call slimes. They stay as a solid. That slimes is uh, the stuff that ends up containing our gold and our silver and uh, all of the precious metals that come along from Mount Isa. And we end up packaging that off and, and selling that overseas as well. At the cathode, it's the opposite thing that's occurring. What we're doing is we're trying to uh, encourage the ions to go into their solid form. So if that was the case, and we had gold in the solution, for instance, it would be the first one that would be willing to plate out onto the cathode. It would be the first one that wants to take some electrons and plate out onto the cathode. But because it never went into the solution in the first place, there isn't anything that's going to plate out. So in the end, all we start plating out is copper. And again, we end up setting up a, a potential of 0.34 volts, except this time it's heading in the other direction. So all of the elements in the pink that are sitting in the solution, they're again saying, no, I'm not willing to take two electrons for that amount of energy, you're going to have to do better than that. And so they stay in the solution and all we end up with is fairly pure copper plating onto our cathode. So that's the process of basically of how we turn the, uh, the anodes into cathodes. One of the biggest problems that we have is if we get uneven growth on the cathode and we form what's called a short circuit. So our anodes and our cathodes are only spaced about 20 millimetres apart each. There's a whole heap of them in a row, they're spaced about 20 millimetres apart. And if the copper growth is uneven, you can get a, a spike of copper basically that comes out and if it grows for long enough, it will eventually touch the anode. And once it touches the anode, there's no need for your oxidation rea reduction reaction to occur, there's no need for electric chemical reaction to occur because now the electrons can simply bypass the whole process. So they see that as a bit of a super highway just to uh, zoom past and not worry about producing copper, which means that we're pumping a whole bit of electricity through this cell for no benefit at all. So it costs us money and efficiency to have that happen. So what we need to do is try and make sure that doesn't happen. And the first thing uh, that we try and do is we try and make sure that everything's spaced as evenly as possible. Because when, uh, if a part of your anode is closer to the cathode at one point, it means there's a smaller gap. If there's a smaller gap, there's smaller resistance. And smaller resistance means you'll end up with a lot more growth. Conversely, larger gap, higher resistance, less growth. And then the, the process sort of feeds off itself because once you get more growth at that point, it then gets closer and closer to the anode and it gets more and more and more growth. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that when we put our anodes and our cathodes into our solution that everything's lined up as much as they can. So our anodes are vertical, our cathodes are vertical, they're not um, uh, askew in any, any which way, any direction. 
and hopefully that will help produce um, good copper. But we can't get that done perfectly every time, so we have a backup plan, and that's using what we call gelatin. Um, when a nodule starts to form and it gets closer to the anode, that section where the nodule is has a higher negative charge than the rest of the cathode plate. So the whole cathode plate has a negative charge because it's full of electrons trying to encourage copper 2 plus ions to come and uh, uh, bond with it. But that particular point will have a higher negative charge than the rest of the plate. So we add a, a, a molecule called gelatin, which is a big, big molecule that has a positive charge. And it gets attracted to those areas that have the higher negative charge. And what it does is it smothers that area. So the copper can't actually get into that point because this gelatin stuff is in the way. So the copper ends up plating out at other points on the, um, on the cathode surface. So that's what we call a leveling agent because it makes the copper plate out level over the whole um, plate. However, even with that backup plan, every now and then it doesn't quite work and you will get shorts. So in that case, what we do is we have a team of guys who work 24 hours around the clock. They uh, walk over the top of those sections with um, special meters, gauze meters, and they detect high current flows, which indicates that there's a short, and then they get a big blade of steel, shove that down in between the plates, knock that short off, falls to the bottom of the cell. Then, once you've broken that connection, everything's ready to roll again. And that happens on a fairly regular basis. We have, we have about a thousand cells uh, in the refinery, They're spread out amongst uh, 37 sections and they probably knock off around three to 4,000 shorts per day for every 24 hour period. So it's just a constant run of guys going over and over uh, the section, fixing up those shorts and making sure that every single electron that we pump through that cell is producing copper for us and not getting wasted. So as the process engineer, your job is to monitor this process and make sure that everything's happening how it should be happening. Make sure that uh, all of the parameters that are involved are within the set points that, that uh, you or somebody else probably before you has decided. So, for instance, you need to monitor the electrolyte quality. You need to ensure that your acid and your copper concentration is maintained. If your acid concentration gets too low, you end up with a higher resistance, which means you end up uh, consuming more power for the copper that you're trying to produce, and so it costs you more money. Uh, if the copper concentration gets too low, then all of those electrons that are asking for copper to come and plate onto the cathode start looking for other things, and that's when you end up getting impurities and things onto your copper cathode. So you want to make sure that the copper concentration stays the same. Um, the other one is if the copper concentration gets too high, what it does is it smothers the anode, because at, at the anode, when it's trying to release a copper ion into the solution, it can't go anywhere because there's so many copper ions that are already there blocking its path and it essentially passivates it and shuts down the reaction. So you've got to monitor all of those things and make sure that, that they're all happening effectively. You, should, you, sh you also need to assess whether your reagents are dosing at the correct rate. So if you're getting a high number of shorts, is that because of alignment issues or is that because uh, your reagents aren't being dosed at the right rate? Is it because your reagent mixing station is broken down and you've been pumping water in there instead of reagents, for instance? Uh, you need to check your impurity levels and your bleed rates. So all of, that, all of the, the green elements that end up sinking to the bottom of the cells, we end up flushing those out, putting them in filter bags and sending them off. They're easy to get rid of. But the, the red elements go into the solution. And over time, they slowly build up. So we need to have a bleed stream in order to remove those elements from the solution. And then we just replace what we take out with fresh acid and fresh water in order to reduce those concentrations. And most importantly, you need to confirm that the required copper purity levels um, that you need in your copper cathode are being achieved. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make that 99.9999% cathode, which gets sold on the market as London Metal Exchange Grade A copper, and it's worth a lot of money. If, we, if we're short by one of those nines on the end, we end up selling B grade copper, and we, we lose you know, a, a sizable amount of money compared to the effort that we put in to try and produce it. So beyond that, because you're looking at a wider process, you also need to make sure that the anodes that are coming into site are meeting your physical specifications. So we don't make the anodes, the guys out at Mount Isa make the anodes, but we have to make sure that what they send us actually meets our, uh, our specifications. 
Um, and usually that's around the width of the anode. Because like we said, if we've got a 20 mil gap between every single um, anode cathode pair, we don't want one anode that's an extra 10 mil longer than another anode because it's going to be closer and therefore causes bad growth. Also, we want to make sure that the taper that they have on the anodes uh, is not too, too bad. Taper is where it might be wider at the top or the bottom. So that means when you put it next to your cathode plate, again, it'll be closer at one point than it will be at another point. So you get bad growth. Um, and then there's also uh, wash. Um, the other side of the thing is with, with the 44 anodes that we're putting in and out of the cells, we don't do that by hand. We use big cranes and stuff to lift all of those um, plates, all those electrodes up and down at the same time. So when we put those uh, anodes and cathodes into the cell, we expect the crane to have loaded everything correctly the first time. If there's a bent hook on one of the cranes and that anode is off by a little bit, then that will be off on every single cell that that crane is processing that day. So you've got to make sure that your cranes are operating correctly. And then lastly, you've got to make sure that your shorts correction team, who's going around knocking off those shorts, is uh, doing an effective job in getting rid of as much of uh, those inefficient shorts as they can. Now, for CRL, for instance, that is just the just what happens in the um, in the cells. There's also a whole heap of auxiliary processes around that that you also look after as an engineer. So this is the, uh, from our process information system, this is just uh, one of the pages that I look at every morning just to see how my plant is doing. So the cells are just the ones that are in red there, the, the chunk that are in red. All the other stuff around it, we've got tanks, we've got heaters, we've got filters, uh, we've got an acid mixing plant, we've got a purification plant, we've got effluent treatment, we've got condensate, we've got a whole heap of other things that you need to look at on a daily basis. And so you monitor your trends and your key performance indicators and you try and figure out is each one of these unit operations that are in your process, are they working as good as they can be? And if they're not, it's your job to go out and figure out why. Okay, so that, that's probably the main thing that you do as a, as a process engineer. You monitor the process and you determine if there's any issues and you go out and fix them. One of your other key responsibilities um, is around data. So processes involve people. All right, you have control room operators who, who sit in the control room and they control the plant. They start and stop pumps. They open and close valves remotely. They make processes go. Um, you also have outside operators. They might go out and uh, open manual valves if we need to bypass something. They might clear a blockage. They might take samples, for instance. You have maintenance crews who are out fixing the parts of your plant that break, because they do break often. And you have management who want to know how much copper did you produce yesterday and at what efficiency and what can I tell my boss, for instance. So because you're the process engineer, you own, essentially, you're the custodian of all the data that's around that process. If any of these people need help, they're going to come to you and ask you um, for it. So what you need to do is be able to connect those people with the data that they need to make the right decisions. All right? It's all well and good to have a process that you look at on a daily basis that you can look at and say, oh, this isn't working, I need to go and start that pump, or I need to go and do that. But it's much better if you have some sort of system which tells somebody else that they need to do that process. So you're responsible for setting up those systems so that you can automatically inform other people of the information that they need to know. Um, so as an example, a relatively simple system uh, that we, we created at uh, CRL, so I've only been working there for about two years, but when I started, they didn't have much in the way of data around their shorts correction. So the guys who would go out and get those big blades and knock off the, um, the shorts that were occurring, they were sort of almost doing that haphazardly. They, they would be split across a couple of shifts, but they would go out, they would know they would have to search every single section, and then start again and search every single section. And they would do that shift by shift by shift. But if you go and search a section, and it's only been searched a couple of hours ago, you haven't had any chance for shorts to form. So essentially you're wasting your time. You're putting in a whole heap of effort, it's not gonna yield you any results. Conversely, if you wait 
12 to 15 hours or so before you search a section, those shorts that have started to be formed end up getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And then they're harder to break off, the guys put more effort in, and also that whole time that they've been formed, we've been losing current efficiency. So they really need to focus on um, attacking those shorts on a regular basis. And that's roughly every six hours, plus or minus two is the set point that we um, set them. But when they started, the only way for them to figure it out was to go through trends individually and try and identify when the last time it had been searched. And for the shorts correction guys, uh, some of them are quite smart, some of them aren't. That sort of thing can take a long time. So you had a, long, a large spread of when these guys were doing these searches. So something like this, where we've split it up into all the 37 sections that we have, and we've hooked that up with our PI information system, our process information system, and we gather the times that the uh, searches were last performed, we put some conditional formatting on that, and we use that as a display screen for their main office. So when they come into the office, they can look at this screen and they can see all the sections that are in green are ones that they've searched relatively recently. So there's no need to go out and search those. All the sections in red are the ones that they haven't searched for a long time, so they need to search those straight away. And of course, the ones in between are, are the ones coming up. So by implementing just this simple sheet, these are the sorts of uh, results that, that we achieve. So, the green section on each of these graphs is the ideal um, uh, search time, time between searches, somewhere between four and eight hours. If you're in the red, you've left it too long. If you're in the white, you've, you've done it too quickly. Before we gave them that simple Excel spreadsheet, because that's all it is, uh, there was quite a large spread in terms of the data about where they were searching. But once we gave them that, uh, you can see with the bottom graph that it's tightened up quite significantly. And just that sort of thing alone has saved us tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, possibly millions in terms of increased throughput through our refinery. So simple things like that that you do as a chemical engineer help your process uh, improve. Um, now the third, I guess, major thing that you do as a chemical engineer is you monitor your process, you provide people with data uh, and systems to access their data and then once all that's set up and everything's running well for you that's going to free up a bit of time and that gives you a chance to go out and try and improve the process. So obviously a main, sorry, something happened there. a main part of your job in the end once you've got all that sorted is trying to get the process improved and when it comes to mining for instance small improvements in sections of the plant result in large gains in terms of profit for the company. CRL, for instance, uh, we process 300,000 tonnes of copper per year. Copper's worth about $7,000 a tonne. So you're looking at $2 billion of worth of copper goes through our tiny little plant every year. And we've only got about 130 employees or something like that. Um, Queensland Nickel's the same. They have billions of dollars worth of copper, uh, sorry, nickel, pouring through that plant every year. So if you can make a small change in a part of the plant that will improve that process, you're going to make big gains for the company. Now, as an example, this one was when I was uh, out at Queensland Nickel. Um, I went to a not so glamorous area of the plant called solar drying. What they do is uh, Queensland Nickel imports ore from overseas, from Indonesia and the Philippines, and um, from quite tropical areas, and when that ore comes in, it's got a moisture content of about 40%. It's really, really wet. Now, the QN process requires roasting at about 1,000 degrees. So all of that moisture has to be removed before we can get it into that roasting process. So in order to reduce the, the load that's on their coal-fired and gas-fired uh, dryers, they lay all that dirt out in the sun for about a week or, or two, and uh, try and evaporate off as much moisture as they can at that point. And somebody a while back had a bright idea that, well, why don't we use a plough? So they would run over the solar dry areas once a day with a plough, the idea being that the stuff on the top is, must have dried, so we'll turn it over, the stuff underneath will be wet, and it'll dry faster. 
So when I went down there and I was told, you know, let's see if we can figure out how to increase throughput through this area because it's a bottleneck for the plant, we thought, all right, well, the simple thing is, are we ploughing enough? Should it be once a day or should it be twice a day? So we did a fairly basic experiment, very basic experiment, where we tried to simulate ploughing. We got three different buckets full of ore. One of the buckets, were, we essentially, in order to simulate ploughing once a day, we tipped that upside down and put it in another bucket once a day. Uh, second bucket, we just did that twice per day. And a third bucket, we sort of had it as a control. We didn't bother tipping it upside down at all. We just left it um, as it was. And of course, we didn't just do this with three buckets. We did it with nine, because you need to make sure that you can statistically back up your data and it's not just a one-off. Now what we ended up finding was that the bucket that we didn't bother tipping at all lost the most moisture. And at first we thought, well this doesn't make any sense, how can this be, we've been ploughing for ages, we thought it was a great idea. But it turns out what happens is, initially when the ore arrives it's quite thick, but as you plough it more and more, you end up breaking it down into smaller and smaller uh, pieces, smaller and smaller fragments. And so when you break it down far enough, essentially what the ploughing does is it places a thin layer of fine material over the top of your stockpile. And that just acts like mulch, it just insulates the, um, the ore stockpile. So even though those particles that are on top are losing moisture and they end up looking quite dry, you scoop away 10 mils underneath that and the, and the stuff underneath is wet because it can't deliver the moisture that's within that ore to the surface for evaporation. So what we found was it's actually better just to plough once at the start so that we get large chunks of material everywhere so that there's a high surface area for evaporation but then just leave it alone because all that moisture that's inside the surface of the ore travels up, continuously travels up to the surface via capillary action because it's all tightly bound and ends up evaporating. And that sort of thing happens right down to when the ore gets to about 15 to 20% moisture. So we made that sort of discovery and instead of going from 40% to 35, we now thought we could probably go from 40% down to 33 or something like that. And that sort of thing I think implemented correctly was worth something like $30 million a year to that refinery. So those, that's basically the three main things that you end up doing as a chemical engineer. You need to monitor your process, you need to uh, be able to display data to people who need it and people who request it, and then you need to be able to come up with improvements. So I guess last slide, why would you be a chemical engineer? For me, um, a lot of it's about the fact that there's a diverse range of issues in your plant. When I turn up to my plant and everything seems to be working well, not true. There's probably about a hundred things wrong with it and it's your choice to go and attack which one you want to attack today. Um, so there's a lot of diversity there. It's, it's practical hands-on work. You're not just in an office for instance. You go out and you have a look at your heat exchangers, you have a look at your pumps, you listen to them, you try and figure out what's, what their issues might be. Um, and as you move beyond being a graduate chemical engineer, uh, you end up owning the plant basically and it becomes entirely up to you what uh, avenues you choose to explore to uh, create value for your company. So there's a lot of freedom involved. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Does anyone? <laughs> all right. Uh, does anyone have any questions for both? <laughs> We've been talking a bit about sustainability and things. Um, CRL started back in the 50s. So, how do I put this? A lot of stuff's gone down between then and when environmentally sustainable, you know, uh, was something that people were sort of looking at. So, there's, at the moment, CRL is, is we're not really sure what's happening because uh, there's potential that a smelter out at uh, Mount Isa might shut down, for instance. So there's potential that we might shut down. And so they've been looking at what do we need to do to rehabilitate the whole plant if that happens. 
And there's things that happen in the 70s, like the burying of large you know, uh, cells and things like that, which, which we probably need to deal with. But I guess as the process is at the moment, it is, um, it is very much environmentally friendly. We have a, uh, a runoff system, so if anything escapes our process, it goes into what we call a, a drain, a long drain, and then that goes into a, um, a dam system where we hold it and test it, and if it's uh, got the right concentrations that we can release it down the creek so it's not gonna kill all the little fish, um, then we'll do that. Otherwise, we pump that back into a part of the plant called the effluent treatment plant and we uh, reprocess it. So we end up producing pure water and the other stuff ends up going back into the plant. So we have environmental processes in place to make sure that we're, um, we're doing that properly. Other questions? Sorry? Uh, as in just because we've got a lot of uh, issues with mining and that sort of stuff at the moment? Is that... My opinion, I don't think you have much of an issue. Uh, chemical engineers are very much in demand at the moment. Um, I know, in fact, you know, if you guys have about six more years experience, there's a job opening at CRL right now. Um, we tend to have a lot of trouble finding good engineers. So if you're a good engineer, you know what you're doing and you can prove that you've got good problem solving skills, I don't think you'll have an issue getting a job. Other questions? <laughs> So is that reducing the number of people clearing the shores? We, um, not really because they're so beneficial. Um, we sort of, the, the number that we have that are doing that process is sort of balanced between what we think we have and what we might need. We've probably got, I think we, we have four per shift at the moment, as an example, maybe we only need three and a half. But every now and then we'll have a process upset where Stuff just hits the fan, everything goes really bad, and instead of doing 3,000 shorts per day, they might be doing five or 6,000 shorts per day. And that's when sometimes we need to call extra people in. So you, you still need to have a little bit of a buffer to make sure you've got the right number of people to approach that task. But what we did do, we did reduce the number of employees that we had recently, probably 18 months ago or so, and we did that just by changing the shift. So we used to have three eight-hour shifts per day, and they used to work for six days on, three days off six days on, three days off, which for me sounds like a horrible shift. But, um, so to do that we had 18 people, but we changed it to two 12 hour shifts um, per day. And what that means is we reduced time for changeover, we reduced a, a lunch break, and we ended up saving about an hour and a half a day. So we ended up being more efficient, so we could drop from 18 people down to 16 people, for instance. And then we made them do a three, three days on, three days off, and they were happier as well because they get more time at home and more sleep. Uh, not likely. Maybe if we were over in Germany or something where they have really, really good um, quality control in their systems and things, but um, in reality you will always need uh, someone to knock those shorts off at some point. Is there a question there? Or? Uh, Anyone else? I've got a question. So, um, what was your pathway from university? So, when you when you graduated, mm -hmm. where'd you go? Um, and have you been, uh, you know, certified status? Yeah, or registered? No. Registered? No. So, <laughs> so I didn't didn't go that Am path. Am I supposed to? Yes, but no. Yeah. <laughs> Would you just like to comment on on the the choices um, in terms of jobs and things that you've made? I guess when I finished uni, the first job that I got was down in Mackay, a place called the Sugar Research Institute. Mm -hmm. um, so that was basically a, an organisation. At that time, it had about 150 employees. It's an organisation where they, they get a levy from all of the different sugar mills throughout all of Queensland, and then they just do experiments to try and figure out what's, what's something we can improve in, in uh, the different processes to make all of the sugar mills more efficient. But I think I lasted there for about 10 months before I decided that work in the real world was not for me. And then I went back to uni and I did a PhD 
through uh, phosphate hill, looking at the reaction of uh, ammonium phosphate in one of their slurries out there and doing a, a CFD model of that. After I finished that, um, I think I didn't have a job for about six months, so I uh, did some promo work for the council, handing out dog leashes. And then I got a job at Queensland Nickel. And I was there for about six years um, before I saw this opportunity at CRL, and uh, now, I'm, now I'm at CRL. Only, so I was employed there as a senior refinery process engineer, and about two weeks ago, I'm now the production superintendent. So um, things are going well for that. Yeah, excellent. So you see a lot of, I mean, a lot of engineers are sort of changing jobs fairly frequently. That's that's a, an experience that most people have, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, it's it's strange, but it's sort of it seems rare that many uh, engineers stay in, uh, in a job for say longer than five years. A lot of people, once they get to that point, they want to go on and experience something new. If you're in, for instance, uh, Queensland Nickel, they've got about nine different process areas. So you might go and work in one area for a, a year or two, and then you put your hand up and say, I think I'm done here, I think I've done all I want to do, can you send me somewhere else? And they'll send you somewhere else. I mean, the, the, the people that graduated with me, for instance, I think there was one guy in his first year managed to have about six different jobs. <laughs> he just had trouble making decisions. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just so you know as well, I finished my uh, degree here at JCU, and at the time, we thought pretty much if you're going to be a chemical engineer, you're going to get a job in mining or you're going to get a job in sugar. Um, I think when I finished, we only ended up with about six or seven graduates. Uh, I know one of them works in uh, water treatment as an account manager. One of them owns his own uh, water treatment firm. Uh, we've got a guy who works in a brewery, which is really the ultimate goal for a chemical engineer. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking about that. Um, <laughs> And uh, there was even another guy who um, went and did a PhD on uh, plastics for heart valves, for instance. And he went over to the States, did some work on that. And uh, I think now he works for Johnson & Johnson. And if anyone uses AccuView uh, contact lenses, he's probably the guy who procured the materials to create those for you. So there's certainly plenty of opportunities around the world. Yeah, fantastic. Any other questions? I've got one final one, and that's, um, so the, the design of the actual process mm -hmm. in the plant and design updates of that, who's responsible for that? Does that go to a, a chemical engineering consultancy firm or do you have design teams on, on site? Or does it not need improving? We have, frequently? generally if there's things that we can improve, mm -hmm. we just end up doing it our, ourselves. We yep. come up with ideas. We have a change management process, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a certified system for doing that. Yep. If you're you know, getting equipment, like a pressure vessel or something along those lines, those sorts of things need to be specifically certified. But if we're just changing, making modifications in the process, small ones, we tend not to need to do that. Yep. But we also have, uh, attached to CRL, we have a group called Glencore Technology. And um, what they do is they, they research all the different improvements that could be made to the uh, copper refining process and they sell that technology all around the world. So, for instance, for me, when I started at, at CRL, I didn't really know how the process worked precisely, but the fact is, you're only operating the process. You don't have to know exactly how everything works. You just have to know that you have settings that you have to achieve, and you have to know how to make sure um, that you achieve those settings. So what to do when things start deviating. Excellent, all right. No final questions? Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So, uh, a couple of final announcements. Obviously, we have our filter testing today. Um, everyone will have filled out their timesheets thus far because you will need to submit that as you test your filter. Uh, it needs to be stapled to your filter assessment sheet and that's how we're weighting your scores. So if you're just remembering it now, because I'm telling you, uh, go and fill out your timesheets. Um, otherwise, we're in our standard groups, the standard hours. I've got 80 litres of Ross River water to filter. If you need more than that, you might need to go on a trip to Ross River. <laughs> All right. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.